Good evening, everyone. Um, I'm Sandra Hoyle. I'm um, president of the Delmar Foundation, and I want to welcome you to our DMF talk, um, Getting to Know Gray Whales, A Lifetime of Research. DMF Talks is the foundation's unique version of TED Talks. We draw speakers from the inspiring local base of creative, intellectual, and scientific leaders. For the past eight plus years, DMF Talks has aimed to entertain, inform, and inspire the Del Mar community through this series of free presentations. We, we gave a couple of tips earlier and in the chat box, but to best enjoy the talk, you should switch to speaker view rather than gallery view. I promise um, you will be able to see everything. Um, I encourage you to turn your video off to ensure there's adequate bandwidth. Um, and we ask that you stay muted throughout the talk and direct all your questions or comments through the chat feature. There will be a short question and answer session following the talk and I'll moderate that chat session and get all of your questions asked. Thank you for all of your cooperation. So our speaker this evening, Dr. David Weller has studied the biology and ecology of whales and dolphins for 25 years. His specialty is in wildlife science, population assessment and evolution of potential disturbance from human activities. His job as the Marine Mammal and Turtle Division Director for the NOAA Fisheries Southwest Fisheries Science Center in La Jolla is centered on collecting data, supervising multicultural teams in remote and often dangerous field conditions, and overseeing lab and analytical work. A major focus has been research on gray whales, and Dr. Weller has authored or co-authored more than 70 papers or reports on this species behavior worldwide. Dr. Weller received his PhD in wildlife and fishery science from Texas A&M University, go Aggies, his BA and MA degrees from the University of Hawaii and San Diego State. At this time, I'd like to present Dr. Weller to you. Uh, thank you, Sandra, for that nice introduction and nice to be uh, in your community tonight. And uh, thanks for inviting me and I hope to entertain, inform, and inspire um, and meet all of the objectives of the Del Mar Foundation. Um, my talk tonight is going to be on, focused on gray whales. It's one element of what I do, but it's probably one of the scientific endeavors that I'm most proud of. And uh, if you hold on just a moment, I'm going to share my screen with you and get my slides going. How does that look? Can you guys see those? Looks great. We can see everything. All right. Very good. So let me get rid of a little stuff on my screen. And uh, let's get started. I've been studying marine mammals for a very long time. And while the introduction said 25 years, it's actually longer than that. That's a, this is a photograph of me when I was seven and my scientist field partner brother Sam at four years old and um, yes indeed those are binoculars and we were actually <laughs> doing what I continue to do this to this day is stand by on shore and count gray whales and watch gray whales as they go by our coast so it really has been a lifetime passion for me and a lifetime endeavor uh, whether it's in science or just purely recreational sport and for fun um, my eyes have always been trained on the ocean and uh, that's a huge part of who I am. Just by way of a little bit of a personal introduction to you, to me, uh, for you, it's, I think it's always fun to learn something about the folks that you're listening to and um, I'll just give you a snapshot of my, my education and academic pedigree. Um, I did my bachelor's degree at the University of Hawaii with a professor there named Lou Herman. And believe it or not, Lou was a dolphin cognition specialist. And so my very early days in introduction to marine mammals were teaching sign language to two bottlenose dolphins, Phoenix and Akea Kamai. And from them, they became my friends and I learned a terrific amount about them. And they, they are the ones that motivated me to go into the career that I'm in. And so I, I owe Lou and the University of Hawaii a huge debt of gratitude for that. Um, I came to San Diego State in the 1980s and worked with a, a jolly fine professor named R.H. DeFran and my master's work was on bottlenose dolphins that move along the San Diego County coastline. It's those dolphins that you see 
that are closest to the beach, often right where the surfers are. And that study continues to this day. It's 35 years long now. And, and we know those dolphins by name and by sight and know a great deal about them. Uh, from here, I went to Texas A&M University, and that was a, a bit of a cultural adjustment moving from Southern California to Texas. But the professor there was absolutely outstanding, Dr. Bernd Wurzig. Uh, he's probably the most respected marine mammologist in the world. And I had the good fortune of having him as my PhD advisor. And with Bernd, I worked all over the world with Bernd on a variety of different projects. But one of the projects that I'm going to tell you about tonight on Western gray whales is I'm not sure I made that line on the screen, but on Western gray whales, Bernd introduced me to. And finally, uh, I've been at the Southwest Fisheries Science Center. Oops, let's see here. This green squiggle mark, did, did I do that or did somebody draw that on the screen for me? Looks like someone pressed annotate. I don't know if it was you or one of our guests. Uh oh. Yeah, I, I will try. I'm going to see if I can try to erase it while you're talking. Okay. We can go with it if it needs to be <laughs> there. It's kind of abstract, but, uh, but we can leave it there if there's no other way to get rid of it. Um, there you go. Thank you. Uh, you're welcome. So before we get kind of into the gray whale biology and science, I just wanted to tell you a little bit about where I work. And some of you may know and some of you may not, but I work for NOAA Fisheries, which is part of the US government. And NOAA is very broad in its scope. It's atmospheric science. A lot of people know the NOAA weather um, information that they depend on for camping trips or oceanography or whatever it might be. But our specialization is in marine mammals and turtles. And uh, our location is where this red dot on the map is. It's in La Jolla. It's right on um, La Jolla Shores Drive. And just to give you your bearing, this is the Scripps Institution um, Pier. This is Scripps, and then UCSD is up the hill. So we've got a beautiful building right here, kind of on the horseshoe corner of the drive there. I'm the director of the Marine Mammal and Turtle Division, and that means I've got about 70 folks that I work closely with, um, oversee and facilitate their science and, and work hand in hand with them on a number of different things. And, I'm not going to go over this org chart in detail for you, but <clears throat> just for you to know, we work on all kinds of things from statistical assessments to marine mammal genetics and turtle genetics, ecology, life history. Um, we do a host of, of work around the world in international waters, but our main focus is here off the U.S. West Coast from California up to Washington. So let's talk a little bit now about gray whales and the, the topic of the talk tonight. And uh, just by way of, of a brief agenda, um, I wanna give you the Pacific Basin wide context for what we know about gray whales and, and help set the stage. Um, I wanna talk just a little bit about the cost of whalings and the impact it had on gray whales some time ago and where they've rebounded to. Uh, I'm going to introduce you to my science that I'm working on currently and have been for, I don't know, the past 25 years. Uh, and then towards the end, I'm going to introduce you to really my lifetime adventure working in the Western North Pacific on a tiny uh, endangered population of gray whales that live there uh, off the coast of Russia. So in terms of taxonomy, the gray whale is highlighted there in the red ellipse. And you can see it's, it's not giant. Um, if you look up above, the blue whale is the biggest of them all up on top. And you kind of make your way down from fin whales and brutus whales and um, other species. This is the right whale and the bowhead whale. But the gray whale is kind of an intermediate size. And I'll talk a little bit more about the description of them and their biology. Sorry, I'm having a hard time controlling my slides. but. <clears throat> I'll get the hang of it. Um, so it's important for you to know that gray whales are recognized as two populations, one in the Eastern North Pacific, and that's our shoreline. Um, and the other is in the Western North Pacific. That's all the way across the Pacific Basin, all the way over to the waters off of uh, Russia and Korea, Japan, China, that part of the Pacific Ocean.
So if we look at that uh, distribution on a map, um, the, the orange ellipse shows you the range of what we call the Eastern North Pacific gray whale population. And it's really from pretty much the tip of Baja uh, to the south, all the way up into the Arctic near Barrow, Alaska, the most northern point in the US. And then even a little bit further, but the important thing for you to know is they range between wintering areas that are in the Baja Lagoons and the Gulf of California, all the way up to Arctic waters in the summer um, in the Chukchi Sea and the Bering Sea and, and up off the coast of Alaska. If you go across the Pacific uh, to the Western North Pacific where you see Asia over there in the yellow ellipse, that population of whales with a caveat, um, which I'll tell you about in just, just a few slides, uh, really ranges between the Sea of Akats, and that's uh, Russia, this is Russia here. The Sea of Akats, this is, Sakhalin Island is here, and then down to Japan and the East China Sea, and even into the South China Sea. And these animals here are a little bit of a mystery to us. These animals over here, we know a heck of a lot about. Um, and so I'm gonna teach you about these guys, what we know, and then I'm gonna end with the adventure and my lifetime work, which is really primarily over in these waters. So conventional wisdom, um, you know about the ENP, Eastern North Pacific, and the WNP, Western North Pacific, and the ellipses tell you where we expect to find those whales, and the blue arrows are really indicative of their migration patterns. And in the ENP, all the way up in the north here, this is where they feed during the summer. So they arrive here in May, they feed through June, July, August, September, October. November, they're starting to make their way back down the coast this way. They hug the coastline for the most part, not following that blue arrow, but they hug the coastline, come right by our shoreline. Um, here, and then make their way primarily down to the lagoons of Baja, some go even further down here, but this is pretty much the southern extent of where these animals go. So this is the wintering area where they're raising their calves and resting. They're not feeding there. And this is the summer feeding area where the calves are weaned and where the whales are trying to fatten as much as possible to sustain them during the six months or so in which they don't feed. In the Western North Pacific side in the purple ellipse, this is kind of the northern extent of where those animals go. And the feeding area that they focus on is off of Sakhalin Island here in the north. This is the summertime. They arrive there the same, May, June, July, August, September, October, even into November. And then they turn around and they start to come down either the Pacific coast of Japan or through the Sea of Japan, making their way to currently unknown wintering areas in the Western North Pacific. And that introduces you to a little bit of the mystery that I'm gonna tell you more about as we proceed through these slides. The history of whaling really decimated and impacted gray whales to a huge level. Um, there were centuries of whaling by Aboriginal whalers. That's a picture of a Macaw whaler in the upper panel from Washington State. Uh, that's a harpoon and those are seal skin float bags in which the whale drags those and eventually wears them down and then the whalers are able to catch up with them. But the aboriginal whaling is not really what took the numbers to, to, to be so low. It was the commercial whaling, that lower panel, the Yankee whalers. Um, when they found the lagoons of Baja in about the mid 1800s, they just slaughtered the population. There's no other word for it. The, those lagoons were full of blood. It was a horrific, scene in which thousands and thousands and thousands of whales were being killed, not only there, but as they started to move north, the whalers moved with them and eventually took whales all through California, Oregon, Washington, Alaska, British Columbia, all the way up into the Arctic. And they hunted them to such a level that they became economically extinct. That means that the whalers no longer could make a profit by trying to focus on gray whales because there weren't enough to be found. Thank goodness they, they weren't extinct, but economically, it just wasn't worth their time. So they switched to other species. And, and that all happened by the, the late 19th century. And then under official protection by what's called the IWC or the International Whaling Commission in 1946 is when we saw the population start to recover <clears throat> from the effects of whaling. 
Uh, it's important to know that, you know, going back to those slides with the colored ellipses, Western North Pacific and Eastern North Pacific, both on both sides of the Pacific, whales were hunted, uh, not only by aboriginals, but also commercially. Um, and only has the Eastern North Pacific population recovered. Those are the whales that live off of our coastline. Um, both of them were hunted to really low numbers, but only one of them has recovered. And that's why earlier I said the Western North Pacific, an, an endangered and really small cryptic subpopulation lives over in those Russian waters. They have not recovered from whaling and we're trying to figure out why. And I think we have some pretty good ideas about why. Um, whaling continues on gray whales and some other species. There is a limited Aboriginal whaling um, effort by Russian communities in the Arctic, and they depend on those whales for food uh, and materials that they make clothing and, and uh, boats and, and other things from. Um, the catch limits for whales that the Russians are taking have been monitored and set since at least the 1970s. And the current catch limit for that hunt off of Russia is about 140 whales per year. Now, <clears throat> that sounds like a lot of whales, but <clears throat> not to give anything away, but the, the Eastern North Pacific population is about 27,000. And so part of what I do and part of what the International Whaling Commission does is we set a quota every five years. We look at how many whales there are in the population we do a bunch of math, if you will, um, to figure out how many can be removed safely and allow the population to continue to grow. And 140 per year is really quite sustainable. It's not even the maximum that could be taken. The maximum is probably triple that, uh, that could be taken before you would see any reduction in the growth of the population. So it's very carefully monitored and regulated. And regardless of how you feel about whaling uh, personally, Scientifically, it is sustainable. So let's talk a little bit about the basic biology of gray whales. And I'm sure all of you have seen gray whales going by our coast. Maybe you've been down to Baja to see them in the lagoons uh, or out on whale watching uh, vessels. But they are you know, the most common large whale that we see in our coastal waters uh, on a yearly basis and a seasonal basis. And, the adults are about 15 meters long. It's about 50 to 55 feet long. The females are slightly larger than males and they weigh in at about 4,500 kilograms, which is about 100,000 pounds. Um, the calves are born at about 4.6 meters or so and about 1,800 pounds. And by six to 12 years old, those calves are sexually mature and they're giving birth to their own calves. The mean date of uh, birth is about mid-January. So gray whale calves are being born anywhere along the migration route and they're coming from the Arctic summer feeding areas. By mid-January, they're pretty much down in Baja and that's why we call those the wintering areas where a majority of the calves are born and then raised there in relatively warm and protected waters by their moms until they begin their migration north a few months later. The gestation period for gray whales is 13 months. Uh, healthy females produce a calf about every two years. So that is, they give birth to a calf, two years, one is resting, one is pregnant, and then the next year, it's essentially the fourth year, they're giving birth again. And they can do that quite late into life. Um, they are continuing to give birth in, well into their 30s, 40s, and even 50s in some cases. Um, and then the calves are weaned at about six to eight months old. So they're born in, um, in Baja, in Mexico. And by about mid-August, they make that first migration north with their moms. About mid-August, after they've learned how to feed uh, in the feeding area, they wean themselves from their moms, or I should say the moms wean the calves from them. Um, and they become independent at that point. Uh, in terms of what they look like, they've got kind of this mottled gray and white coloration. And it's, you can see that coloration in the cartoon uh, at the top of the slide. And I'm going to show you a few pictures in just a moment. Um, they also have these very dense clusters of barnacles and small, tiny cyamid crustaceans, which are called whale lice. 
and they're orange, they're bright orange. And so if you see a gray whale up close, you're gonna see not only barnacles, but also barnacles that are surrounded by a halo of orange. And those are actually really small crustaceans uh, that feed on the dead skin that the barnacles are killing as they're attached to the, to the gray whales. On the underside of their throats, they've got two longit longitudinal creases, which I'll sh show you a photo of. They've got a couple of crenulations along the back here. This is what we call their dorsal fin. And along their back, can you see my mouse, by the way, as I'm doing this? Yes, we can see your mouse. Yes. OK, good. So this is the dorsal, the dorsal hump. And then these are the knuckles or the crenulations that I'm talking about here, those six, six to 12 crenulations. And then their flippers are really quite small. You might know humpback whales, which have got these amazingly long flippers, but uh, gray whale flippers are really small. And it's important to know that flippers are indeed flippers and in that they've got the bony infrastructure in them. Dorsal fins and dorsal humps like this are not. That's just all tissue um, and no bony support there. So here's a couple of pictures of the things we just talked about. This panel up on the upper left here, this is a gray whale head. The whale is swimming to the left. The blowholes are right here. And you can see these giant barnacles, which are attached to the whale. That halo of light gray is dead skin from where the barnacle has attached itself. The skin around it dies. And then in between are these crustaceans, or the whale lice, the cyanids, that are really specialized on feeding on this dead skin. And you can see here on the head, there are a bunch of barnacles and there's zillions of whale lice. Um, this panel right here is a gray whale swimming to the right. It's just starting to dive. And it gives you a really nice example of how beautifully colored they are. And they're actually born with very little color. If you look up here, this is the calf. But within a few months of being born, you can see that that calf is, well, one, it's kind of like a little pickle, but two, it's almost all black. Um, but within a few months of life, it's starting to get this color. It maintains that color over the course of its life. And that's how we get to know individual whales by that coloration fingerprint, if you will. And then finally, this is the head of a young gray whale. This is the very tip of the rostrum, this part of the head is right here, it's upside down. And these are the ventral grooves on the throat that I mentioned to you. And you might know maybe humpback whales, which have got hundreds of grooves and blue whales, or not hundreds of grooves, but um, tens of grooves along their throat. And the reason gray whales and blue whales or humpback whales have different numbers of grooves is based upon the way they feed. And here's a good example of how gray whales feed and what they feed on. Um, primarily, gray whales are bottom feeders. They head down to the bottom and with their tongue, they kind of engulf mud, they spit it out, they engulf it, they spit it out. And what they're looking for are these tiny little amphipods. That's their prey, that's what they love and that's what they like to eat. And these guys live in the mud or slightly above the mud so gray whales have a common nickname called mud diggers or clam diggers. Um, they take that water and mud into their throats. With their tongue, they push the water back out. These are the baleen plates hanging from the upper jaw, and those serve as the sieve. So the water goes in, the tongue pushes it back out, and when it pushes it back out, the amphipods are caught on the inside of the baleen plates and then swallowed. So if you're up in the Arctic during the summertime and you're in a plane and you're looking down below, if you see something like this, it's a giveaway that it's a gray whale. So here's the gray whale here and these are the mud plumes. So the whale was swimming here and went down to the bottom, took up a big mouthful of mud, filtered it out, came up to the surface, took a breath, went down, took a big mouthful of mud, came up to the surface, went down, so on and so forth. These are called mud plumes and uh, it's a pretty dead giveaway that what you're looking at is a gray whale because it leaves behind these signature footprints uh, of mud based upon the way that it feeds. In terms of migration, they're one of the uh, animals in all of the world that undertakes the longest migration. There are others comparable, but gray whales are right up there amongst the record long distance migrators. And that's on an annual basis, they're migrating somewhere between 15 and 20,000 kilometers. And that is, as we've talked about from here off of 
know, the tip of Baja all the way up to uh, the Chukchi Sea in the Arctic, and then all the way back down. And so this is within a year, they're making this migration. They, they start here, if you will, they come down here, they hang out for a little while, and then they come back here all within the period of a year. So then, and as that, that line says, it's between Arctic feeding grounds and Mexican wintering grounds. Um, in terms of the gray whale research that I do currently and at our center, um, it's multiple and I'm just gonna walk you through a few of the projects uh, that I work on. One of them is to estimate the abundance of the Eastern North Pacific population. And by abundance, what I'm talking about is when somebody says, how many gray whales are there in the Eastern North Pacific? We're the ones that generate those data. And the way that we do it is quite easy. We sit on, in an in a enclosed trailer in a site just uh, in the very northern part of the Big Sur coast, and we count gray whales as they pass by. And this is the same thing I was doing when I was seven years old and that my brother helped me when he was four. Um, there I am with binoculars just a lot of years long later, but doing the very same thing. But the cool thing about what we're doing in this case is we're actually collecting data and we're estimating and adjusting for nighttime passage rates, periods of time when the weather is poor and we can't do our observations, so on and so forth. A lot of statistical manipulation of the data in order to get at these estimates of abundance. And you can see the abundance is here. That's the total number of gray whales in the Eastern North Pacific. And then these are the years of our surveys. These started in the late 1960s. They continue to this very day. And you can see the population has gone up, up, up. It came back here. There was a die off here. It came back up. It's kind of bouncing around. But the most recent abundance estimate that we have is this um, green blob. And that represents about 27,000 whales in the Eastern North Pacific. It's the highest number that we've counted in this 50 year time series of data. So we've got a pretty good handle on how the population recovered from that whaling that we talked about, how it grew and grew and grew. It reached some capacity and some ceiling in which it died back and it came back up, kind of came along at a plateau and then shot back up to the highest numbers that we've ever seen. Now that's not to say that this won't come back down again uh, and it very well may, but you can see the resilience in the population if you protect them and you give them the chance to grow. We also count the number of calves that are born in a given year. And here's, here's the same technique in a different place. This is at the Pedros Blancas light station in San Simeon. And we head up there every spring. We set up shop. We live there. We've got our same enclosed trailer and binoculars. And we sit on shore out on this point. And gray whale mothers and calves come right along the coastline here. They come right by us close enough that we can say hello, and then they're headed to the north. And that's mothers and calves that we're after. We're interested in knowing the number of calves that are born. And in this panel, you can see in any given year, it ranges from about, sorry about that, about 1,600 calves, all the way down to about 200. And this really has to do with the conditions in the Arctic the preceding season. So if there's heavy ice or light ice or good food supply or bad supply, bad food supply, mothers will produce calves at different rates. So in good years, we know the environment is good for gray whale calf production. In bad years, it can get very low, but in uh, subsequent years, it'll increase again. So again, a pretty simple method of being onshore, being diligent and counting and using some, some math in order to get to these estimates but we're able to follow not only the abundance of gray whales, but also how many calves are produced on an annual basis. Both of those are pretty important for management purposes and understanding whether further conservation or protection measures need to be implemented. Uh, photo ID and biopsy sampling, these are both really wonderful and fun methods and techniques uh, that we use. And <clears throat> in a nutshell, if you get a good photograph of a gray whale of its side, both of these whales are swimming to the right. You can see how different they look from each other. That's their fingerprint. If you get the same picture year after year after year, you can easily track and follow uh, the same whales over time. And uh, the question came up earlier as to whether they get numbered and named. And yes, they do for some catalogs and in some places and in other places, 
uh, people only give them numbers, but we've named the whales that we know and that we collect information on. So we've got a lot of them and uh, it's pretty fun to, to be honored with uh, having a gray whale named after you. We collect those types of photographs from small boats. We also do the same from shore. Um, in this panel over here, this has to do with what's called biopsy sampling. And <clears throat> with a crossbow, a low powered crossbow and a dart, which you see flying through the air here, we've got a little tiny coring sample on the end of that dart. It hits the whale, there's a rubber stopper on the dart which makes the, the dart recoil back out of the blubber. And what we find in that tip, that coring tip, is a piece of skin right here and a piece of blubber. And you can see how small it is. It's about an inch long, something like that. They're really quite tiny. But from that, we can do a dozen or more bioassays. We can look at contaminant levels, we can look at biotoxins, we can look at genetics, we can get the sex of individuals, we can get the age of individuals. So all from this tiny little piece of skin and blubber, we can learn a heck of a lot. So it's, it's one of our core staple methods that we use in addition to photo ID. Um, we also work from the air. And for years and years, we flew airplanes with bubble windows in the belly and we took photographs of gray whales from above. Um, and we're able to do body measurements on gray whales to see what kind of conditions they are, they're in, and then correlate the condition that they're in with the feeding conditions in the Arctic. And what we learned by doing this is that by taking simple ratios, in this case, length to width, this whale here is a southbound whale. It means it's coming from the Arctic and it's going to Mexico. It's off of central California. And you can see the widest point on its body is right here behind the flippers. This whale, also southbound, coming from the Arctic to Mexico off of central California, the widest point on the body here is pretty far back. The flippers would be here. She's got her flippers stuck down her side, but the widest point of the body is much further back. This is a pregnant female. So it's kind of neat that using photographs and using simple uh, math, we're able to determine uh, reproductive status of animals from, from the air. Uh, what we're really excited about is that we've really shifted our use of airplanes to almost zero. And uh, one, nobody really likes to fly in a tiny airplane for a really long time over the ocean. Uh, it's somewhat dangerous. It's not that much fun. Um, but what we've gone to is using unmanned drones. And there's all kinds of drones that we're using now, but these are some of the smaller ones. Um, Underneath this package right here, we're putting our cameras, similar cameras to what we used in planes, but miniaturized. And here's a nice example of the quality photographs we get from flying a drone from shore over gray whales. That's a mother gray whale and her calf just to her right and to the rear. Uh, so dynamite images in which we can now do the same kind of measures, length to width. We can do the same with the calves and we can look at their body condition. Uh, we use tiny tags that are satellite linked. So this is a satellite uh, tag that transmits to satellites when whales surface. We apply those tags to the, the side of a whale with the same dart that we take a biopsy with. When whales surface, it transmits to a satellite. We get triangulation data on where the whale is and we're able to track them in time. And this example gives you a couple of tracks. This study is one in which we put tags on in the Baja Lagoons, and we wanted to see how whales move through the Southern California Bight. These are the Channel Islands, here's San Diego. And what we were really interested in knowing is understanding how whales move through the shipping lanes that are associated with Los Angeles and Long Beach. Um, to understand whether we needed to change those lanes, change the speed at which ships uh, went, uh, go through the area, and what the risk actually was. And so by attaching those little tiny tags, you can see the movement data that we're able to obtain remotely. Um, it's all filtered back to our laptop computers, uh, if you will. Another really fun project that, and data that we learned from using those same tags um, as many of you know, killer whales during the northbound migration tend to pick off gray whale calves. So they harass the moms and then they pick off the calves and eat them um, in a variety of different hotspots. Monterey Bay is one, but also there's a passage through um, 
the Alaska Peninsula called Unimac Pass, in which most of the gray whales, all 27,000 of them nearly, pass through this little tiny pass right here as they're making their way up to the summer feeding grounds. Now these red dots are tags that were attached to killer whales. And before gray whales are getting here, this is like um, the early part of the summer, like early May or so, this is what the, the killer whales are doing in that area. Now, later in the summer, as gray whales are squeezing through that pass and making their way up here, look what the killer whales are doing. They're following the gray whales as they're making their way north. So another really interesting and fun bit of information that we can glean from those little tiny tags, uh, not only on gray whales, but killer whales and all kinds of species as well. This is Um, so what about the Western Pacific? It's pretty easy to see how, you know, you can work in California or Mexico or even the Arctic up in Alaska because it's the U.S. or it's Mexico. We're all, you know, it's very civilized areas, which easy access by car and by plane and by ship. And, you know, it's a relatively easy place to work. But what about the Western North Pacific? And this is really where uh, 25 years of adventure entered my life uh, in the mid 1980s. And it's really a story that I wanna tell you about what I learned as a scientist, as a person, um, and some of what went into really, when we started our project over here, nothing was known about gray whales. They were even thought that maybe they were extinct in this part of the Pacific. And so we took it upon ourselves with the support of many to find out what the status of that population was. And, and we've done it, we've learned a tremendous amount in about 25 years of time. Um, so this was my postdoctoral work. And at the time, my advisor, he said, hey, Dave, you know, you're about to finish up your, your postdoc and, um, or you're about to finish up your graduate degree at Texas A&M and are you interested in doing a postdoc? And, you know, we've heard about this study that needs to be done in Russia. And I said, sure, love it. You know, I was all for adventure. It was a great time in my life. And um, what I didn't know, but what I know now is that the work in Russia was in Sakhalin Island, which is in the far eastern part of Russia, subarctic. And it was way, way, way out in the middle, middle of remote wilderness. Where the gray whales are is here. This is where we ended up stationing ourselves and the team continues to work there to this day. But you can see there's no roads, there's no buildings, there's no towns, there's nothing here. So we quickly learned uh, as a brand new minted PhD um, that Chekhov was well aware of Sakhalin Island and he wrote a book called The Journey to Sakhalin. And what he said about this, we read about before we ever went there and his quote from that book is, I've seen Ceylon, which is paradise, and Sakhalin, which is hell. Now, I wouldn't call Sakhalin hell, but I would say that it is a dangerous, uh, remote, and difficult place to work. So the way we got in and out of our field camp was by way of this pretty seedy-looking Aeroflot helicopter. Now, this was all new to us. We had no idea what we were getting into, but we had Russian colleagues that assured us we can do it we'll make it work and, and sure enough, they were right and we did it, but it was a, it was a struggle. Um, but, and relatively unsafe, I have to say. When I came home and I showed these pictures to people that were doing some of those uh, aerial surveys in, in NOAA aircraft, they're like, oh my gosh, I can't, believe, I can't believe that you would even get into that thing. Um, so anyway, we survived, but it was one of the first challenges is getting in and out of that remote field camp and the way to do it was by way of these helicopters. This is what our field camp looked like there. It was a Soviet era lighthouse on the left, which is pretty rusty. Uh, and then a couple of small outhouses there, uh, cabins, if you will. And the means of communication was by way of radio. So these are radio towers with essentially ham radio in here for the lighthouse keeper to contact or relay from station to station. So it gives you an indication of how remote it was. And at that time when we started, there was there were no cell phone connections there. We even satellite telephones weren't working there at the time. So we were really on our own to figure it out. Um, we adapted a kind of a rundown cabin um, to suit our needs for a bunkhouse. 
um, to allow us to live there and to function and to, to do our research that we needed to. But as you can see, it's a pretty remote and desolate place. There's not a lot of luxury about this facility in any way. Um, when we first got there, the snow had collapsed the roof into where we were planning on building the bunkhouse. So the first undertaking was to repair the roof and remove the debris that was inside the house. Um, that said, we learned a lot. We were completely self-sufficient. There was no running water. There was no electricity. We needed to find all of our own wood uh, to heat the house, to cook our food. <laughs> We had a well in which sometimes when you looked into the well, you were never sure what you were going to see uh, floating in the water. I won't tell you what we saw, but it was mostly rodents and animals. Um, but we lived for the good weather and we, we were there because we were passionate to know what the status of this endangered population was. And this is a, a really fun picture because that's the sunrise and we're so used to seeing the sunset uh, on this part of the Pacific where we live. But across the Pacific, you see the sun rise over the ocean. So this is early morning, us preparing the boat to get out on the water to, to do what we love to do. Uh, the arch enemy there was fog. And so we're talking about a, a really remote place, a tiny cabin, and our field teams were generally composed of three or four Russians and three or four Americans. Uh, all kind of stuffed into this tiny little place, no running water, no electricity, a bunkhouse. Um, and when we would have weather like this, we're not able to work from the small boat. There's no navigation. You can't do photo ID or anything that you want to do. And this fog would sometimes come in and set in for 20 to 30 days at a time. And so it was kind of like a reality television show in which we had four Russians, four Americans living in this tiny place under really bad conditions. It was like a hostage crisis almost, more than a reality television show. But we learned a lot from it, and I'm so thankful for, for those experiences. Because what I did learn as a scientist was that you've got to be self-reliant, and you need to think through every single thing that you're doing in advance. Um, winters come really early there. That's a picture from the first day of September. We always tried to push our stay there into October. So you can see the difficulty that we would face just to do the work that we wanted to do. We would even need to take the outboards in in the evening so they wouldn't freeze. So any water that was left in them in the evening would not freeze. And then we'd haul them back out, attach them to the boat, lug the boat down to the water and, and go away and do our work. Um, we learned a lot. It was a great experience for me. It was very international. This is a picture of me and my friend Janu Kim from Korea, Grisha Sadulko, Russian, and me watching the sunset in this case. But there was a high degree of camaraderie, of learning, and of um, passion for the science and why we were there and what we were doing. And kind of a, you know, one of the more rewarding things in the end, um, as I was winding down my time there, was reflecting on integration with the Russian society. And we were welcome from day one. Anything that the Russian lighthouse keepers or families that we met along the way, anything they had, which they had almost nothing, they were more than willing to share it with us. We learned to play the accordion. We learned how to drink vodka. We learned how to make hats. Um, whatever it was, they were there for us. Oftentimes, we couldn't even speak the same language, but the unspoken commitment to each other and supporting each other was just huge and, and very rewarding, even way beyond the science. I mean, it's one of the most important things that, that I've had in, happen in my life as, as a professional. So I'm going to take you back now just to that conventional wisdom. And remember what I told you about gray whales migrating back and forth here on the Eastern North Pacific and gray whales migrating back and forth here in the West. Well, one of the true gems of our time over here off of Sakhalin Island that we learned was this. We put a few of those satellite tags on whales here off of Sakhalin Island. Dr. Bruce Mate and uh, a bunch of us worked on this project. And what we thought we were gonna see is the whales from that feeding area in Sakhalin moving to the south down off of China, which is what we expected. That's the conventional wisdom. But what we saw the six whales that we tagged do was actually come right over to our coast. And in fact, 
This whale in blue was tagged here by Bruce Mate. Bruce at the time was working at OSU and it swam right to Bruce's door essentially uh, at Oregon State University. But that's not the end of the story. So what we learned from this, the conventional wisdom said whales stay in the east or they stay in the west. And what we learned is that some of the whales in the west actually come over to the east, but some of the whales in the west stay in the west. So really, inevitably, what we did after 25 years of work is we learned a lot, but we introduced a whole host of new questions about gray whales, how to conserve them, and how to protect them. So that's the, the end slide for, for my presentation tonight, and uh, represents, I think, the 25-year the commitment and the adventure and the fun and the hardship um, that I undertook and so many of my colleagues did in order to learn something about gray whales and be able to be here tonight to share that with you. Thank you so much. That was really, really fascinating. Uh, if anyone has any, I have some questions written down that we got earlier this evening, but if anyone has any other questions, if you could direct them to the chat and I will start. I know we've heard some of these questions earlier and you actually answered some of the questions. <laughs> Shut uh -oh. up. I'm listening right now. Please make sure you're muted. <laughs> Um, so one of the questions was that um, the whales appear very friendly with their calves in the lagoons and then what happens as they mature? Um, so that it's a very uh, it's a very special example of a behavior that seems to be site specific and so that is if you go to San Ignacio Lagoon, for example, in Mexico and visit the gray whales that are there, and, and remember, this is the very place I told you that they were really slaughtered by Yankee whalers, same lagoons. If you go there today and you go out in Apanga with the, um, the Mexican researchers and scientists, ecotourism uh, folks that work there, mothers and their calves will inevitably swim right over to you and allow you to pet them on the head and give them a kiss if you're so inclined. Um, it's called friendly behavior and friendly whales. It, it started to be first observed in the 1970s in those lagoons. It continues to this day and nobody knows the reason why whales are friendly there. But the same whales, when you encounter them, let's say off of Puget Sound, off of Washington, they're not friendly. Um, but when they come back in the winter, the same whales will return and be friendly again. And so the calves learn the behavior from their moms and they institute that into their own calves. But you don't see the friendly behavior like that anywhere else within the distribution, whether it's in the east or the west. You will see curious gray whales that swim over to boats, but nothing like opening their mouths, allowing you know people to scratch their tongues and that is unique to that place. And it's just one of those magical mysteries that I hope we never know why, but it's so poignant that it's in the very place in which the population was taken to near extinction. Thank you. So you have a few more questions. Another question that came in was, how has climate change affected our local whale population? Well, right now, if you remember that graph that I showed you, how the population size goes up and it comes back down and it goes up and comes back down. And so one of the things that we're watching pretty closely is climate change and the impacts it has, particularly on sea ice. So sea ice in the Arctic in that summer feeding area is really important for prey dynamics. It feeds the ecosystem, if you will, the sea ice does. And what we know about sea ice now is that it's going further and further and further to the north. And so our question is, is that eventually going to impact gray whales? At this point, I would say we're not seeing that because the population is at its all-time high, despite the fact that climate change is also happening in parallel. But it may be a short-lived phenomenon in which it's over time, maybe over decades, that we start to see the true impacts on gray whales. Now, that said, there are other species like polar bears and walrus, which are just suffering terribly because of the reduction in sea ice. It's taken away their livelihood, if you will. Um, so gray whales seem to be doing okay at this point, but there certainly are other marine species that are not. And I say that based largely upon the changes in sea ice that we're observing. And then I guess the, fun, the question I think everyone has right now is how long were you in Russia? 
Well, that was the, the project carries on to this day. Um, so we started that project in 1997. It's the, a field team just finished today. And about halfway through that project, after about 15 years, so I would go every summer and fall. Um, you know, I kind of made it my mission to bring my team and, and to be there to deploy there for three to four months every year for about 15 years. And the study has carried on uh, after that. So we learned a lot. And the reason that that we handed it off, it's it's all Russians now, is that um, the country changed significantly in the time that we were there and the administration and, and kind of the attitude towards foreign science, um, corruption and bribery and all of those things really set in, in in force in which when we started there, it was wide open, it was, it was quite easy, but it became more and more and more challenging. And so finally we said, how can we keep the project alive and keep going and not face this difficulty and the, the logical solution was for our russian partners just to take over the project and we support them now from behind the scenes okay that's very good what do you think about sea world is one of the questions oh boy <laughs> um, i don't know i'm i'm not going to comment on that one <laughs> okay that sounds like a good answer um one of the questions is why are gray whales so sought after <clears throat> uh by who by people? I guess they didn't ask that. Maybe they can chime in on the chat while uh, I ask another question. Um, the, another question is, so you showed the graph that um, displayed the two locations that the whales are. And mm -hmm. this, um, this participant wants to know if there are any whales on the east coast of the United States. Mm. Yeah, thank you for that. I neglected to say that, but there was an Atlantic population of gray whales that uh, is extinct. Um, how, however, uh, in the past 10 years, there have been two gray whales seen in the Atlantic, um, both of them in pretty crummy condition, not looking all that healthy, but uh, one was off the coast of um, uh, Spain and the other was off the coast of Namibia. And so it's likely that what they did is when they went to the north, they made their way through an ice free environment that allowed them to transit into the Atlantic and then kind of make their way, I think, lost and wandering, but make their way into the Atlantic. So it's not out of the question that they could repopulate the Atlantic. There was a population that once existed there, but, but not today. But it may be that that, that can happen when the sea ice re retreats to such a level that there is no blockage between uh, ocean basins. Okay. Um, okay, so Carol's question was, why are gray whales so sought after by people? Mm. Yeah, that's a good question. You know, I would, I would bounce that one back to you guys. You know, I have my own um, thoughts about it and that I think there is a, there's a general desire to contact with, to make contact with creatures that are in the ocean or even alien life. And I don't mean to get weird on you, but I mean, that's out there as well. It's like, we want to make contact with something that's not us. And I think gray whales are accessible. They're close to shore. Um, and they represent, you know, if you're Californians, they represent the coast of California. I mean, they are an icon of our coast. They are the whales that we grow up seeing. Um, so I think there's a connection there and wanting to make a connection with an ocean creature uh, is really what it's about. But, you know, I'd be curious to see, to hear what one or, one or two of you have to say about that. Why do, you, why do you go out to see gray whales? Okay, fill that in the chat room and answer that question, everyone. <laughs> Um, one of the last questions that I have so far is, um, how do barnacles get on the whales? Mm, they transfer from one whale to another as, as larvae. So as whales are close to each other and in contact with each other, mothers and calves or even adult whales, they can either in the water column or transfer from whale to whale. The larvae actually attach to the skin of a whale. They burrow into the skin. So as, as, as larvae, they burrow into the skin, under the skin, and as they grow that shell, they're starting to emerge back out. Um, and that's what causes the necrotic tissue around the barnacles, but it also allows the larvae not to be swept away by currents because they're burrowers. And so their first stage of life is to burrow into the skin and then eventually emerge out once they're developing that, that carapace or, or shell. Okay, that's a good explanation. Thank you. I'm double checking. I'm waiting to see if, oh, I may have missed it, but did you tell us the typical lifespan in years of a whale? 
Yeah, it depends on the species, but I think for gray whales, you know, some of some of them we've known for close to 50 years now, and I would say that an an educated guess would probably put them in the 70 to 80 year range, something like that. There are some whales that live much longer, bowhead whales, for example, the Arctic ice whale. Um, they have been found, bowhead whales are, are hunted uh, by aboriginals in Alaska and embedded in some of those whales that they catch have been stone tipped harpoons. So that have been carbon dated back to 200 years or so. so the whales are, you know, getting onwards of 200 years old, some of them, some of those bowhead whales. So it depends on the species, but, but some can be very, very long lived. Wow, that's amazing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it really is. Um, okay, I know, I know you got asked this right at the beginning. And so I'm going to give everyone one last chance to throw any questions in the chat room. And I feel like you answered this during your presentation, but Julie, <laughs> Julie asked this, so I wrote it down, but she was curious about what other ways that you identify whales, like on site, by spouts. I mean, obviously data has improved, so you have way more ways to do it, but what are some basic ways that you identify the whales that you're tracking? There's, there's two ways to do it. Um, one is with the photo ID, with their natural markings, that kind of uh, modeled coloration pattern, which essentially becomes their, their fingerprint. Uh, so through photographs and photo identification, the other way is through biopsy sampling. So once we get a sample of a whale, then we forever know who it is based upon the genotype and we can match. So if we go out and we take another sample 10 years from now and we don't know who it is, but we match the sample genetically, then we know who it is. So there's two ways to do it. One with DNA and the other is by photographs. Thank you. Okay, I have one more and then I think we'll wrap it up. Um, this is from Melody. I was at Barrow Point in the 80s when the Eskimos living there won the rights to continue whaling. Has whaling by locals changed over time, more or less whaling done now? Um, yeah, that's neat, a neat adventure for you. That picture that I showed at the very beginning of my talk was me with the bowhead whale skull there in Barrow. Um, and so I, I work quite closely with the Aboriginal whalers and part of what I do through the International Whaling Commission. And that, um, that hunt there off of Barrow has really not changed very much over time. The bowhead population has increased substantially as gray whales have. But the hunt really has not changed all that much. They're very traditional in the way that they hunt. Um, as you know, if you interacted with the whalers there, um, the whales hold a very special place in their culture and they're very uh, in tune with conservation and protection and not over harvesting a resource that is not only subsistence, but also a spiritual resource to them. So the hunt has changed very little since they were granted that, uh, that waiver and that ability to hunt. Thank you. And I wanted to thank you, Dr. Roller, for joining us tonight. We My really, pleasure. really appreciate you it. You've gotten lots of compliments in the chat telling you they appreciate it and they learned a lot. And I um, wanted to thank our audience for joining us this evening. And um, we're gonna wish you all a good night. All right. Thanks very much. Thanks for your interest. Appreciate Thank you. it. All right. Stay healthy.